and I'd like to welcome everyone to the first program in our fall book sandwiched in series. As always, our thanks to those who helped fund programs like this through FFRPL, the FFRPL committee members who curate and organize these events, our guest reviewers who graciously share their time and talents, the library staff who help with our setup and production, and the thousands of people who tend throughout the year. Thank you for your participation. Today's selection is The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan. The state of the Great Lakes is a particularly timely topic. According to the regional journalism collective Great Lakes Today, of which WXXI is a partner, the recent devastation in Texas and Florida brought by hurricanes Harvey and Irma serves as a warning for cities far to the north, such as Rochester, as climate change is expected to increase the number of storms crossing the country. Our reviewer today is Veronica Volk, the Great Lakes reporter and producer for WXXI News. Veronica holds a BA in Communication and Media Studies from Fordham University. Growing up on the Jersey Shore, Veronica experienced issues affecting coastal communities. In 2014, she traded salt water for fresh water when she moved just a few miles from the shores of Lake Ontario. Please join me in welcoming Veronica Volk. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful day. We've got quite a turnout here. Um, I just wanted to start with a little brief introduction um, of myself. Like, I said, like Susan so rightly said, I am a reporter with WXXI News. I cover the Great Lakes environmental economic issues for a collaborative called Great Lakes Today. You can find us at greatlakestoday.org. Um, and I work with a fabulous team of journalists, and we cover issues all across the Great Lakes region. Um, of course, being from Rochester, I have a particular uh, bent in that direction, so some of my reporting reflects that, but I found that this book, while it takes uh, a really broad look at the Great Lakes as a whole, we can really take some of the lessons and apply them right here in our backyard. So, I wanted to start with a brief introduction of the author. Dan Egan is a reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He's a senior water policy fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's School of Freshwater Sciences. He has twice been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and he has won the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award and several other awards that I'm not going to list right now, but he's a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School, and he lives in Milwaukee. Now, I had the uh, pleasure of reaching out to him and speaking with him a bit before I gave this talk today, and I wanted to ask him to introduce himself and his work in his own words, and he wrote to me that he's traveling today, and he doesn't so forgive his brevity, but he's a native of Green Bay, Wisconsin, who spent his early career reporting in Idaho and Utah before returning to Milwaukee in 2002. He says, nothing like living in the desert for a decade to come back and appreciate the Great Lakes. The book is largely the sum of reporting he's done for the Sentinel, which is a Gannett paper, as some of you may know, since becoming a full-time Great Lakes beat writer in 2003. He says that he's got to go. He has an interview in 15 minutes. As you know, the news never stops. So thanks, Dan. You're great. Um, I want to say that before when I was first asked to review this book, I was a little bit hesitant. Um, as a reporter, I have to read a lot of texts about the Great Lakes, and some of them can be a little bit rambly and dry in their you know, reciting of stats and figures, statistics, historical dates, but that was not the case with Dan Egan's book. The Death and the Life of the Great Lakes, I was thrilled to find out, is um, a narrative, if a little foreboding, which, uh, Dan, in which Dan lays out what he thinks is the greatest problem facing the Great Lakes today. And it's not climate change, he says, it's not erosion, it's not pollution, it's invasive species. Now, many lakes historians and reporters will start their texts about the Great Lakes at the very beginning. They go all the way back to glacial ice that carved and eventually filled out these massive tubs that are directly to our north. But Dan Egan starts at a different point in history. He starts at the building of the St. Lawrence Seaway. 
Now, some of you guys may know the St. Lawrence River runs from the eastern end of Lake Ontario all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. And the river is natural, but the seaway itself is man-made. And while the biggest modification came in the 1950s when Eisenhower um, approved legislation so that they could build seven 30-foot deep locks into the seaway. And it was hailed as this massive infrastructure success that was going to turn cities like Rochester, like Buffalo, like Toronto, and Hamilton into these international ports. Egan argues that the public was sold a bill of goods. Um, not only did that not happen, uh, but the consequences of these ocean freighters coming in were somewhat catastrophic. Uh, ocean freighters brought with them all these um, aquatic hitchhikers like quag mussels and spiny water fleas because they are these huge ocean liners that take on and release water uh, in order to balance their weight. So they were taking on all this water from the oceans and letting it out into the lakes. And it, they did not immediately foresee the consequences of this, but we've seen invasive species thriving in the Great Lakes as a direct result of some of this. At the same time, um, other invasive species were making their way up from the Erie Canal. So you saw introduction of species like the sea lamprey, which is sometimes called the vampire of the Great Lakes. Um, also through the Chicago Canal. So you um, saw little bait fish like alewives um, that were really thriving in the area. So he then goes on to talk about the ways in which humans introduced the species in somewhat more intentional ways. Um, some species of Asian carps were actually brought here by fish farmers in the south in order to keep their fish ponds clean because they would like eat all the algae and uh, plant life at the bottom. But um, to paraphrase Jeff Goldblum in the Jurassic Park movie, if you may have seen, nature found a way and huge rains brought floods that ended up uh, pushing Asian carp into streams and rivers that have emptied, emptied into the Great Lakes. Um, Humans also introduced salmon, which feasted on the alewives, creating this thriving fishing community. But Egan argues that the salmon population is propped up by artificial hatcheries, some of which we have right in our own state. Up the road in Pulaski, there's a salmon hatchery right on Salmon River. Um, and that this threatens native species like lake trout and whitefish. So the picture that Egan paints in this book is bleak. <laughs> it's dark. Um, and I know from my own personal reporting experience that it's, a lot of it is true. There are right now 180 um, invasive species thriving in our Great Lakes, many of which we can find right here in Rochester. And they were all brought here either intentionally or accidentally by humans. And Egan writes about an ongoing and unparalleled ecological unraveling happening below the lake surface. We see it right here in Rochester, as I said. Right in our backyard, we have zebra and coaga mussels, uh, which filter the water down so that it looks clean. But what they're actually doing is disrupting the food chain in this really profound way. Um, we have Asian grass carp, round gobies, alewives, and as I said before, our huge salmon uh, fishery. And that doesn't even touch the aquatic plant life that we have from people who have brought them in through their aquariums or have, again, hitched rides on um, giant ocean liners in this ballast water. So myself and my colleagues at Great Lakes today have done uh, extensive stories on the effects of some of, this, some of these introductions. And a lot of them are a little bit too technical to get into now, just exactly what the effects are and how they impact you and how they impact your environment. But if you imagine that like the food webs that we studied in school and how intricate and how perfect they were. Now, if you take uh, an invasive species, which Invasive species have been said to have these like superhuman or superhero-like powers or supervillain, I guess, however you look at it, which makes them so perfectly crafted to take over these environments in which they uh, in which they are introduced. They have um, they become so successful in these waters that they become a huge threat for the native species and the lake's ecology as a whole. So, like I said. It's a little bit bleak. But uh, Dan Egan's book does not leave us down in the dumps, thankfully. Otherwise, this would be a very different review. Uh, in the third part of his books, he talks about the future and what we can do. And he proposes two somewhat radical but also somewhat predictable theories. Number one, he says, you got to stop the invasive species at their source. 
Egan proposes that we shut down the St. Lawrence Seaway, which he argues is already far too outdated and small to, ac to accommodate these large ocean freighters. When he wrote this book, um, in 2015, the seaway let through an average of two ships a day. Um, and, th and then closing this would prevent the spread of more invasive species through this ballast water. He also proposes plugging the Chicago Canal, which would effectively reverse the flow of the Chicago River. Pretty radical idea, but his argument is, we did it once, let's change it back. Let's bring it back to the way it was. This would prevent the Asian carp that we're seeing kind of coming up the river from getting into Lake Michigan and kind of disrupting the food web that way. The second of his proposals is to let the lakes rebalance themselves without any more human intervention. So stop stocking non-native fish like salmon and alewives, and don't introduce new fish to try to combat the old problem. You know, don't bring in another invasive spe species that you think might actually help in this way, maybe if we just tinker it a little bit. He says that that's a bad idea. Um, he, sa he argues that human uh, intervention has already been unsuccessful and therefore um, native fish need to adapt to new sources of food and we kind of need to take a hands-off approach. Uh, he uses the example of whitefish, which are a really inspiring story right now. In Lake Michigan, whitefish were almost completely decimated by the introduction of quagga mussels because the quagga mussels were competing with the whitefish for food. But what happened is the whitefish started to eat the quagga mussels. And in the beginning, it was really tough because their digestive systems did not easily digest, they just try, kind of like ate the mussels whole and their digestive systems had a hard time like breaking down the shells and the fish were in bad shape. But fishermen of these fish are seeing now this evolution of a species right before their very eyes where not only are their digestive tracts able to better kind of break down these shells, but the whitefish are also going after different prey fish, which is completely unheard of in this species up until this point. So Egan uses this as an example to say, if we just lay off, then the lakes will find a way to rebalance themselves. We've already done enough harm trying to, do, trying to fix things. Let's maybe see if it can balance itself out. Um, if we take our hands off the wheel, so to say, the Great Lakes may sustain themselves. So I have some thoughts on this, obviously. Um, one of these is that the, these ideas are backed up by science. There are a lot of conservationists and environmental scientists that are very pro these two theories. Um, they say that the lakes may be able to come back from this ecological destruction if we can stop adding to the problem. But I don't know that these ideas will ever come to fruition. Um, to be completely honest and totally frank, both the shipping lobby and the people that make their living from sport fisheries have a seat at the table when we talk about Great Lakes conservation, and these two proposals are not popular with these interest groups. Uh, but as Egan argues, we are spending millions of dollars on Great Lakes restoration already without eliminating the source of the problem. And he writes, before you start administering chemotherapy to a lifelong smoker, wouldn't it first be wise to get the patient to stop smoking? It's a little bit of a simplified analogy, but we'll take him his word. So I just thoroughly enjoyed reading this book, um, not just as a reporter who is delving into these issues myself, but as a reader. He has this way of, um, of like playing with the language to paint this really vivid, again, if a little dark, uh, description, um, picture of what we're dealing with in the lakes. So um, just, I'm just gonna read a brief uh, excerpt. Consider his description of one invader. He writes, the grotesque mug of an Asian carp, a monster-sized fish used in government experiments to gobble up excrement in Arkansas sewage lagoons. Right? Gross. Um, and I'm particularly fond of his description of the sea lamprey. The ancient fish had a sleek body and a fat head. Atop that head yawned a single nostril, and the little creature's two beady eyes were set back from the front of its face and pushed to the side. Then the mouth. It was just a round hole in the bottom of its head rimmed with 14 fangs in a manner that created the most absurd and exaggerated overbite imaginable. <laughs> that's a real fish that's in the lakes right now. Um, so not only is this book just an awesome read with very colorful descriptions and and really vivid language, but it's also super informative. 
Um, there is actually a section I read about in here that I had never learned about where they're talking about secret government experiments to create these genetically modified fish to try to solve the carp infestation. Um, and it's just compulsively readable. So Rochester is lucky to have Lake Ontario in our backyard. And in a lot of ways, sometimes it can be easy to forget because the city itself is set a little bit apart from the lake. And we have traditionally, in the last few decades at least, turned our back from the water in some ways. But um, because Lake Ontario is right in our backyard, we're also responsible for its well-being. And uh, the Great Lakes hold one out of every five gallons of fresh water on this planet. And at a time when we're starting to recognize that scarcity of clean water and ex uh, access to fresh water is an important resource, it's up to people that live on the lakes, people here in Rochester, to be good stewards of those lakes. And that means balancing its entire ecology, not just looking at pollution or development, but also considering the ways we can help this invasive species, excuse me, invasive species problem. And the lakes contain a multitude of species that need our help. You know, these are animals that through no fault of their own are here and, and going through these same problems as us. So if we take care of them, they will provide us with endless food and the water will provide us with water and recreation for generations to come. And Dan Egan lays out just a beautiful argument for taking care of this invasive species problem by not taking care of it at all, really. But um, yeah, it's a fabulous book, and uh, I highly recommend it. Even if you are not interested or not studying Great Lakes issues in general, um, it's very down to earth, very easy to understand, and very good. And I liked it very much. Thank you. So I wanted to open up the floor uh, for questions. Gary? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, go public. Absolutely. So Gary asked me to describe a little bit more um, the consortium that I work for and how I came to be a part of it and how it came to be in general. Um, Great Lakes Today is a collaboration between WXXI in Rochester as well as WBFO in Buffalo and IdeaStream in Cleveland, all public media organizations that are kind of around the Great Lakes. And it was originally founded after, after these three stations received a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to do more reporting on the Great Lakes, um, the environmental and economic issues that face these regions, uh, especially at a time when it's become so important to think about, you know, where our fresh water comes from and what climate change is going to affect, how climate change is going to affect us and what these invasive species mean for the health of the lakes. So that was back in 2016, I believe. Yeah, the summer of 2016. Um, I became involved in the project because I was doing general assignment reporting at WXXI, you know, reporting on City Hall or, you know, uh, maybe doing arts feature science stuff. I was a little bit of a jack of all trades. But this particular project allows for um, long term and long form investigative pieces. And it really takes uh, a very like long and hard look at some of these interesting stories that aren't just about science and technology and, and the scientists that are working on the Great Lakes, but also just about how all of those issues are affecting us right here in Rochester. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to tell some of those stories and give a little bit of a Rochester perspective to them. And that's how it happened. John. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Do you 
John, so John asked about some of my coverage um, along the shores of Lake Ontario during uh, some of the spring flooding that I, I wonder if you guys have heard of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I spent a couple of, I want to say a couple of weeks really doing some intensive uh, reporting along the shore of Lake Ontario. As you guys may know, um, it was a very wet spring and a very warm winter. And we also had a new regulation plan that a lot of people had questions about. And uh, we saw some really high water devastating some homes along the shoreline. And it was a really good illustration, I think, of the way that Ro the Rochester community is connected to the Great Lakes as a whole. Because while Rochester and Greece and other um, kind of shoreline communities were being affected by the flooding, we were also seeing flooding across the border in Montreal and Canada. And it got people thinking about some of the ways that the St. Lawrence River is connected to Lake Ontario and how Lake Ontario is connected to the upper Great Lakes and some of the ways that the water flows. So it was a really good opportunity, I think, for us to take a moment to realize like our place in this huge network and this huge ecosystem and what some of the future may bring. Uh, a lot of scientists involved in you know, studying climate change and hydrology are saying that we might be seeing more of this. We might be seeing wetter springs that lead to higher w lake levels. Um, and I really wanted to get in, you know, get kind of down to the question of like, what can we expect from the future and, wh and what factors went into this? Um, if you're interested, we have plenty of that coverage at greatlakestoday.org. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for your question, John. That was a really interesting experience for sure. That's a really good question. Um, I'm not familiar with the specifics. I'm sorry? Oh, gosh, my, um, my bad. Um, so he asked about the rate at which water was flowing through the St. River, or St. Lawrence River, right, the seaway, um, after the flooding. And you said 11 knots. So I'm not sure necessarily about those numbers, but uh, that would be definitely a good question for me to look into. Um, I can't honestly say that I know the answer to it now, but. I'll get back to you if you like. Um, we'll that. The question was about whether or not the rate of water moving out of the of Lake Ontario was affecting the fish migration. We had some little discussion, which I'm sure we can, uh, we can continue after the discussion. Um, I'm happy to you know, ask around about those questions, but thank you so much for, for bringing that up. That's great. Scott? I know a lot of familiar faces in here today. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. His, he makes the argument that it would be more economically beneficial and, oh, I'm, I'm really bad at this. So, thank you. Um, Scott asked what Egan's answer is to those who would like to see products made in the Great Lakes region shipped out to sea into international markets, correct? So, Egan says that it would be more economically feasible and faster if we were able to load these um, these freighters onto trucks or rails and then ship them to the East Coast. And he says that a lot of the shipping that happens in the Great Lakes is confined to the Great Lakes. You have a lot of you know shipments going back and forth between Canada and the US. You have a lot of shipments going between states. But the majority of the international shipping or the, all of the international shipping is a very small percentage of what happens either in the Great Lakes or worldwide. And that it would be beneficial for us to shut it down because it will protect the environment, which has its own economic repercussions and would also save us some money in the shipping sector. Uh, her question was, how involved are the Canadians? Um, 
That's a really good question. For right now, from what I understand for Egan's book, which is actually something I'm going to look into a little bit more, is that the U.S. is really pushed to keep the seaway open and to keep these other factors in play, whereas the, the you know, Canadian side isn't as vocal about you know, trying to keep these pathways open. But it's definitely something I'm going to follow up on because I know that um, the relationship between U.S. and Canada when it comes to the Great Lakes is just so important and so interesting because in a lot of ways we have some of the same goals from each government has some of the same goals in like being good stewards of these lakes. But sometimes, especially now, we see um, differences in policies and we're all sharing these lakes. So how do those different policies um, come into conflict with each other or complement each other? Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yes, so very important point. I'm sorry, what's your name? Larry, Larry pointed out that when we talk about 20% of the world's fresh water, and you know, when I say things like one out of five gallons, we're talking about surface fresh water. That does not count the uh, water that's in uh, like glaciers and ice caps, um, which is an important distinction. But also in terms of drinking water and readily available drinking water, I think that's kind of why that number is used. Yeah, but thank you so much. Um, purple shirt. Hi. Yes. Um, your name? Nancy asked if there was a, maybe a possible solution in cleaning these freighters or cleaning the ballast water or the hulls um, instead of just shutting down the seaway at all. And actually, there are regulations in place to clean the ballast water, either you know, by um, kind of blasting it with chemicals to uh, clean it out that way, or they dump ballast water into the Atlantic and pick up fresh water when they come into the Great Lakes. Um, the problem with this is that, Egan says, is that when we consider the consequences of this, we are not 100% sure that these are effective for a couple of reasons. When we first opened the St. Lawrence Seaway, nobody thought that um, these species would be able to survive in freshwater environments. Nobody thought that the species that were picked up in the Atlantic Ocean would survive in Lake Ontario, and we were wrong. So even though there hasn't been a new invasive species introduced since 2006, I think, there's always the possibility that we're missing something. And Egan says that's a risk that we really can't take. And you can clean the ballast water all you want, you can clean the hulls of these ships all you want, but he says that you know, the power of nature is strong and he would rather not risk missing something. Thank you for the question, by the way. Sir? Sure, and your name? John asked about a, uh, a cleanup project on the Great Lakes that um, President Trump's budget would effectively eliminate. But um, the project you're talking about is called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And uh, the last we've heard from congressional hearing committees is that it's going to be safe under some of the most recent EPA funding proposals. Um, this is a project that sets aside $300 million uh, a year, I believe, for Great Lakes restoration um, projects. These are wetland cleanups. These are uh, water quality projects, and they're even waterfront development projects. So you see like people um, building parks along the water or green spaces. Um, and I've done extensive reporting on some of the Great Lakes restoration projects around here, and you know my colleagues have covered it elsewhere. And for the most part, it's a really popular and 
you know, nonpartisan program. I mean, people really like it. Um, and the trend for the Great Lakes in terms of the health of the lakes, in terms of water quality, is going upward. Because another mission of these Great Lakes restoration projects is to clean, is to clean up a lot of toxic sites, um, which I think everyone can kind of get on board with. Like, let's get rid of these areas of concern. I mean, the question is, it's, it's only refunded every five years. So you kick the can down the line five years, and we'll see you know, what happens. But for now, at least, it seems that that project is safe. But thanks for your question, John. Sir, in the back. Dan. Dan, hi. Uh, good question. Dan. Dan asked if he was also implicitly or explicitly uh, suggesting that we deregulate the lake of Lake Ontario. And he did not make mention of that particular issue. Um, there is one reference to the hydroelectric power dam, the Moses Saunders power dam that bridges the you know, uh, US and Canada across the St. Lawrence River. But he does not talk about lake water regulation at all. Um, and I honestly think that that's because Plan 2014 wasn't passed until, plan, until 2016, and this book was finished by then. Um, and it may have just kind of been outside of his scope of reporting at this particular time when it comes to invasive species. But I will say that on behalf of the people who have been fighting for Plan 2014, they would say that it is important in restoring some of the native species that we're talking about losing in, in the Great Lakes ecology. Um, and now how that fits into like the overall lake management plan, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we still have a, a little while to go before we see the full effects of that regulation plan for sure. Because, I'm sorry, because what? Um, okay, so the question was, what effect does Lake Ontario have on us as a community? And, you know, that's, an, that's a question that could be answered in several different ways. People um, have different relationships with the water, right? It might be that you use it for recreation, if you want to go to the beach or if you want to fish. Um, it's used for our economy in these different recreational and fishing uh, industries. But also, you know, we still have ports along Lake Ontario that are involved in shipment between different Great Lakes cities. Um, and of, of course, it affects, you know, our weather patterns as, as we've seen in many a winter when we get a lot of snow or many a spring when there's lots of rain. So it's just an inseparable part of us in a lot of ways. Um, it's just very much part of our community. And it's something that I think people have the tendency to take for granted, but if you go to like landlocked places, you kind of start to miss it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. The question was, I'm not sure where the question was. <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase. Um, I believe what you're asking is whether or not there is a vast consortium, or at least a push, for governments to unify so that we can kind of pool fresh water. about making decisions about fresh water or about shipping? Or are we talking about fresh water that we're drinking? Okay. 
Good point. So Gary brought up that there is, you know, there's all this fresh water in our backyard, and sometimes the idea is floated that that fresh water might be available as kind of like a product or something that we could sell. Um, and I will tell you that this is a very highly contested issue, and there is kind of a precedent for this. There are laws that govern where you can and cannot take the water and who gets to drink the water that's in the Great Lakes. And you have to be within a certain border around the Great Lakes. Um, there are certain exceptions for this for certain companies. For instance, Nestle is one of the most popular examples of this. They have an agreement to use Great Lakes water to make some of their products, um, which is also controversial. But in order to kind of change that rule, there would need to be like a lot of legislation. And it's pretty unpopular, at least on behalf of the people that live here that don't want to share their water <laughs> because, um, you know, for whatever reason, yes, we can share snowfall instead. Um, but, you know, of course, we have to, of course, but on a more serious note, we have to recognize that as water becomes um, a resource and we start to think about the scarcity of that resource, you know, we have literally the western side of our country is burning right now and we have droughts going on um, all year long in some areas. And when you start to think about water as a commodity, um, it will, I think, some be something that we need to consider more realistically in the future. But right now, I don't think that we are going to be selling water anytime soon. We'll see. Well, besides this. This bottle of water. Oh, from Wegmans. The comment was that the bottle of water costs more than gasoline, which I think kind of just points to the the idea that fresh water is, is becoming a little bit more of a, not a scarce resource, but it's more front of mind, top of mind, this fresh water. Yes, Lima. Yeah, so oh, I'm, yes, yeah, sure, of course. Mm, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yep. The question was about um, the wind turbine proposal uh, off the Genesee River. And from what I understand, that is still being looked at, but um, no forward progress has happened. But we're going to continue to cover these things at greatlakestoday.org. Um, and are we, we'll take one final question, sorry, before we start the clapping. Sir, you in the back. Um, the question was about closing the St. Lawrence Seaway and what agency or um, a governmental body would have to take the lead on that. And from my understanding, it would have to be a binational agreement between the US and Canada, since both use the St. Lawrence Seaway for international shipping. And it w it, there would have to be a legislative process on our side, because the Seaway was built through a legislative process under President Eisenhower. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that goes. Like I said in my remarks earlier, it is a controversial issue, and it 
there are um, shipping lobbyists and uh, others who really wouldn't like to see that happen. So I'm not sure that it ever will. Thank you. Thank you so much.